So the next speaker of the conference will be introduced by Susan Kelly. Gives me tremendous. This is on. Gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce Lisa Feigenson. Um, Lisa and Justin, uh, her equally nominatable um, husband, played very important role in my life. So I moved to NYU in 1996. Um, because I wanted to live in New York. And NYU was not the eminent department that it is today. Today it's a really, really excellent department. Then it was a good department. And I was worried whether I would be able to attract the kind of graduate students that I had been able to attract at MIT. Um, my first two graduate students were Lisa and Justin. Um, and um, this put my mind at ease. But for Lisa, it was touch and go whether she would actually come because she had grown up in Ithaca and had absorbed the cultural construction of New York as Gotham. And so she was a little afraid of New York City. Um, and she was actually considering going to the University of Chicago instead, which is in the middle of Hyde Park, which is a much, much more dangerous part of the world than New York City, certainly Greenwich Village. So I asked an older graduate student um, to knowing this about her to show her how wonderful it is to live in Greenwich Village. And this student took her to a, they went to a movie together, an early movie before dinner, and the following thing happened. Um, they were sitting in the third row of this movie and then there was a single man right in front of them in the second row, and in the front row there were two women who were talking during the movie. And the man kept saying, shh, would you please be quiet, shh you're bothering us, et cetera, and she, they kept talking. So he stood up, he leaned over them, he picked up their popcorn, he dumped it on their heads, and he said, I said, shut the fuck up! <laughs> and and so, so this student said, I've been going to movies in, in New York City for years, nothing like this, this doesn't usually happen, nothing like this ever happens. Anyway, she came, and um, the, the, she took her one week to love New York, um, and um, uh, the rest is history. So as many people have said, one, one of the joys of being a professor is working with graduate students. And bo both Justin and Lisa's work have influenced my work um, to a degree that probably no other students have. Um, and uh, both of them go have gone on to extremely illustrious careers. Their work set me to change my research program about 10 years ago, and you'll hear about the progress that I've made on new lines of research in my talk uh, today. Um, but both of them were very big influences on changing that direction, and both of them, as are Aggie and Erno and John Remy, no, he's, he, he, and John Remy Hogman, um, are PIs on a network grant in, uh, funded by the McDonald Foundation in which we're developing this work. Um, so um, there are paradigm examples of what many of the, the uh, introducers have said. Um, she uh, came, when I moved to Harvard to set up a developmental lab um, with Liz Spelke, which was worth it to me even though it meant moving back to provincial boring Boston, um, uh, they came with me and um, helped me set up my lab there um, uh, while finishing their degrees at NYU. Um, and then took a job at Johns Hopkins where they are both still um, professors. Um, her work was has been well acknowledged with honors. Um, she got a John S. McDonnell Young Career Scholar Grant in 2007, the Moyd Boyd McCandless Award in um, 2010, and in 215, the, the 2015 <laughs> uh, 
um, the Trolland Award, which is the American National Academy of Sciences um, most prestigious early career award. You have to be under 40 to get it, and it's in the cognitive sciences and the cognitive neurosciences. Um, her work is incredibly creative and wide ranging. She's worked, uh, and much of it is in, some of it is in collaboration with, with um, Justin. They have worked on number representations. Um, she has worked very largely on working memory representations in infancy and their relations to number representations and abstract set representations. Um, and um, she's worked on what the functional significance is of the longer looking in violation of looking time experiments and recently uh, worked on whether empiricism is innate um, so very wide range of research. I don't know what what the actual what part of it she's going to talk about today, but I guarantee you're in for a wonderful ride. Thank you um, to Susan and for all of you for being here. I have to say that I think some of you out there will particularly relate to me when I say that um, the chance to work with, with Susan as a PhD student was really a dream come true. And so it's more than a little bit surreal for me to be <laughs> introduced by you today instead of the reverse. That feels very strange. Um, and maybe one of the only places in the world I can think of that my mind can like wrap around that and make sense of it is here at uh, the CDC at CEU because this is such a special uh, place. I think that what you guys have built over the past many years um, is so impressive and uh, both in terms of the center and in terms of this gathering of scientists. Um, the, the, the papers that regularly come out of your labs, the intellectual depth of those, of the students you train, the creativity of your experiments are um, inspiring to so many people around the world. And so I feel really, really lucky to be able to be part of honoring that uh, here today. Um, back to Susan for just one second. Um, she, of course, is, is, is indelibly linked in all of our minds um, with her stunning work on conceptual change. Um, so, you know, the idea that sometimes with, with enough evidence of the right kind and the right kind of learning machine, uh, the learner can change their mental model of the world in really radical ways, including in terms of using concepts that weren't there before learning happened. And so what I thought I'd try to do today is to sketch out a complementary picture um, in a, in a very much tinier and more modest way, um, a complementary picture that flips this a little and thinks about how the learner's prior model of the world um, shapes what, what get, gets learned at all. Okay, so I'm gonna do this except in the reverse order and I wanna frame the conversation in terms of a debate, a very old debate, maybe the central debate for our field, the debate between nature and nurture. And so the talk is gonna progress in roughly two parts. Uh, in the first part, I wanna think about what people's intuitive models, what people's intuitive theories about uh, the origins of knowledge, about nature and nurture, um, where the, what those might be. This is the empiricism work that Susan mentioned. And then uh, in the second part of my talk, I wanna uh, think about how knowing this uh, may be useful for uh, thinking about how we, how we do our science. Um, okay, so of course, the question of how much of our human minds stem from nature versus nurture is a very old question that's animated uh, discussion for, for thousands of years with very vocal opinions on each side. Um, so some, some thinkers like, uh, like John Locke suggest that really all of what we know is the result of our accumulated experiences. So here's Locke saying, uh, let us suppose the mind to be white paper, void of any characters, without any ideas, how comes it to be furnish, furnished experience. And then there are folks like uh, Rene Descartes who say that at least some knowledge must be, at least some ideas must be innate. Um, 
those ideas, which involve no affirmation or negation, non-propositional ideas, are innate in us for you can to get them from the sense organs. So I'm going to take it that all of us in this room agree that there's something right about both of these positions, that impressive amounts of learning take place over the lifespan, and that there has to be some initial structure in place, and that what's at stake is how much initial structure and of what kind, and does it go beyond like the tendency to, to process sensory information in certain ways. But I also want to point out that the very debate itself, the nature-nurture debate itself, has gone through ups and downs in popularity over the years, with sometimes people arguing that it's not even a coherent debate, it's not even a useful debate to have at all. Right? Why? Because, they sometimes say, everything's a matter of interactions. So there's no nature or nurture. It's all a mush of interactions uh, between these. So they'll say, like, you can't even have the possibility of a structured mind without certain experience, like uh, experience to particular prenatal hormones or uh, experience of having certain nutrients in the womb. Without those, you won't have a mind at all. Right? And of course, that's, that's true. But uh, here I'd point to... Uh, comments made by people like the philosopher Richard Samuels who say that when we're asking whether some aspect of the mind is innate, we're asking not whether it arises under any possible biological or physical condition, but rather whether it depends on any prior psychological experience or psychological processing as an ingredient in that interaction space. Okay? Um, now, whatever your own personal stance is on the nature-nurture debate, I also would argue that the debate's been undeniably productive for our field here, right? It's in part because we want to know what of what we know relies on learning that we have discovered, or really that people you know, among you in this room have shown us that there's a striking suite of perceptual and cognitive abilities that's present from the first days or weeks or, or months of life. So, right, we know that um, very early on babies tell colors apart, they can tell distances, things that are near versus things that are far. They can tell things that are human face-like from things that are not human face-like. Um, they think that an object will fall to the ground without support. They think that an object will still be there if it's occluded. Uh, they can tell approximately more from approximately less. They prefer people who behave in certain ways, like people who help others achieve their goals, compared to people who behave in other ways that hinder people from their goals. This is just a, a, little, a little sampling. And that we know all of this, I think, uh, underscores that we owe a debt to the nature-nurture uh, debate, right? It's been very useful from an empirical perspective. And moreover, I want to suggest to you in some data I'm about to show you that people, non-scientists, just lay people, also find it very intuitive and very natural to think about the mind in terms of nature and nurture. Right? It doesn't take special training to be able to at least represent the possibility that something could be uh, inborn or due to evolution, due to our genes, and that something could be experience dependent and uh, rely on, on learning. These require no special background. And so, in some sense, it might be the case that our intuitive theories about the origins of our own knowledge are kind of like our intuitive theories in other uh, domains. So we can take as an example the domain of objects and object uh, motion. People who are not specialists, who are non-physicists, reason about how objects behave, right? They'll be able to represent or predict the trajectory of something if you, if you drop it or the arc it'll take if you throw it, right? Um, but what's really interesting is that many years ago, Mike McCloskey showed that even though everybody, untrained folks, share the same intuitive theories about object motion, these intuitive theories are sometimes wrong. Okay, so I've illustrated that um, with one of McCloskey's lovely examples here. Um, he asked adults, like, what, what, what will happen to a moving object if you tie it to a string and you're whirling it around like this, and then you cut the string? And in this case, many, many adults will say that when you cut the string, that object will continue along its path in a circular motion. Right? because it's acquired some kind of internal force or internal impetus that keeps it in that, in that circular path. Now, of course, this is, this is wrong. The object doesn't have any magic force inside it. The object will travel along a straight path from the moment you cut the string. But people share this entrenched belief, and it's really, really hard to overturn it, even after these adults have taken college-level physics. Many of them are still stuck in this state of reasoning. Um, and what's also quite fascinating, 
is that McCloskey showed us that this same theory of, uh, of intu intuitive theory of object motion was shared uh, by um, philosopher scientists in medieval and pre-medieval times. So their formal theories of how objects would move also appealed to this like hidden impetus force. And that's what you see here in this uh, etching or drawing down below. Um, their formal theories predicted that an object launched from the cannon was gonna go like this until its impetus was expended and then it would uh, plummet to the ground. So what I mean to show you by this example is that um, humans sometimes reason in systematic ways that are wrong and those intuitive theories that can be partially wrong potentially sometimes color our science, as in the case of the, the medieval uh, scientists. And so that's gonna bring us back to, to the nature-nurture question. And the first thing I wanna consider today um, is whether it is possible that here too, uh, non-scientists, non just people on the street, also have intuitive theories about where our own human knowledge uh, come from. Um, and given that that's a question that motivates so much of our work, that motivates work in psychology, that motivates work in cognitive neuroscience, that motivates work in linguistics, it just seems like a question that we really want to know the answer to. Right? Do we hold biases when we come to the table? Um, so to take to take a, like a, to make a, an analogy, if you're an astronomer trying to study the stars, you're going to want to know if your instrument, if your lens is distorted, because if it is, the data reaching your eye will also be distorted and may lead you to uh, make the wrong conclusions. Similarly, if we're psychologists trying to uh, understand the origins of, of our knowledge, we're also going to want to know if our instrument um, might be biased in any systematic ways. And so that's the question that my former graduate student, uh, Jenny Wong, set out to answer. And so Jenny focused on those exact cases of perceptual and cognitive abilities that I mentioned earlier, precisely because we know so much about them, precisely because the past several decades of experiments um, have shown us about um, when, when, when they arise and that in these cases they have early origins. But what Jenny did is she asked non-specialist uh, adults about each of these cases of core knowledge, like when people thought they were first present and what their origins were, okay? So I'll just illustrate with the case of uh, approximate number knowledge. Um, Jenny told participants about a fictional character named Alex. Um, she said, look, Alex sees these two cookies. There's chocolate chips in this cookie and there's chocolate chips in this cookie. Um, when could f Alex first tell which cookie had roughly more chips? Okay, and participants uh, clicked a picture on a timeline. The timeline actually extended beyond this into adulthood, but I'm just showing this uh, portion here um, to indicate when they thought the ability first arose. And then she also asked about what participants thought the origins of that ability are. So how come Alex could tell which has more? And here participants just typed in like any kind of free response they wanted. Okay, so Jenny asked about these seven core abilities. We also tested a few anchor items that we thought would generate consensus among participants as either being attributable uh, to nature, you know, being in people's genes, um, or attributable to nurture and arising through experience. And so those anchor abilities were seeing and hearing, um, which we thought would generate nativist responses, and uh, a culturally constructed ability, knowing how to read. So, for example, Alex can see things with her eyes. When could Alex first see things with her eyes? How come Alex can see? Okay, and again, using the clicker for the timeline and uh, typing in um, a response. Okay, so Jenny and uh, her research assistants coded people's free responses whatever they typed into the box in the answer to the how come question, as endorsing one of four kinds of explanations for the origins of knowledge. Either they endorsed a, 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 a nativist explanation, a, mat, a, a maturational explanation, this ability just sort of like emerged over time, um, endorsed learning, but at an individual level, like Alex you know, figured out how to do it on her own or enough experience, um, or a, a explicit pedagogical uh, explanation, like somebody taught her. Okay, so, uh, here's how we're going to plot participants' responses. For each of these uh, seven core knowledge abilities and for the anchor abilities, I've put up here, it's a little hard to see, but there's like a green plus symbol next to each of those. And that 
plus symbol is meant to depict um, our, our best evidence for when the uh, experiments tell us that the ability actually emerges. Okay, so for each of these seven core abilities, I take it that evidence suggests that that ability is present in some form at that age. So you can see all those green pluses up there align with the first image, uh, the image of the little baby, which for subjects was marked zero to six months. Those pluses are there because they, they tell us that, th those are meant to indicate that experiments tell us that those abilities are present in some form before six months of age. Okay, so they represent a comparison against which we can look at people's uh, answers. Okay, so here's what we found for the anchor abilities. For seeing and hearing, people were accurate. They said that people, uh, Alex, could see and hear at birth. And those circles are blue. And those, those blue, that blueness shows us that people spontaneously gave, uh, uh, appealed to, to, to nature in their responses. They said things like, well, she can see because it's just in her genes or she was just born that way. Okay, and then for the culturally constructed ability of learning how to read, people were also accurate. They said way over there on the right side of the, gr of the graph, that ability onsets late, and she learned it because somebody taught her um, or because a few people said she, she figured out how to do it on her own. Okay, so what about the core abilities? Um, so for the, for the example of which has more, you can see that people estimated that the age of onset of being able to tell approximately more from approximately less was late, like during the early preschool years. Okay, what's more, that circle is mostly orange, and that tells us that people thought that being able to tell more from less is more, is more like being able to read, right, than it is like seeing or hearing. It's something that had to be learned. So for example, a very typical, typical kind of attribution people made was, well, she could tell more from less because she, after she saw things around her and after a while, she eventually figured it out. Okay, and so what's really interesting to us is that that pattern was very consistent across all of the different core knowledge abilities. For all of them, people overestimated their age of onset and people attributed these abilities to learning experience and instruction. So you can just see all of that orange up there, right? Now, you may be wondering whether maybe a reason for that pattern um, was the way we asked the question. Okay, was it due to the particular wording we used? So in the experiment I just showed you, we asked, when could Alex first tell which had more? And we thought, well, like maybe, maybe we're, that connotes metacognitive abilities, or maybe it connotes verbal abilities, like maybe subjects misinterpreted us and thought, when could Alex tell other people which had more, or something like that. Um, and so to deal with these kinds of worries, we replicated this experiment many different ways. Um, and here I'm just showing a couple of the other wording conditions that we used. Um, so when we ask people um, the same, about the same core and anchor abilities in terms of uh, observable behavior, like rather than which, when could Alex tell which had more, when could Alex first reach for a cookie with more? Um, or in terms of hidden brain states, like when did Alex's brain first respond differently to more versus less? Or in terms of epistemic knowledge, like when did Alex know which had more or less, it didn't really matter which way we asked a question. Um, people's answers always patterned the same way, leading us to conclude that people you know, attribute core knowledge to empiricist or origins no matter how we really ask uh, the question. Okay, so that raises a bunch of interesting questions for us. One is whether this empiricist bias we observe is specific to knowledge specifically, right, in particular, is it about what people know, or is it just about any aspect of people's mental lives? Are people empiricists about all aspects of the human experience? And so to find out, we turned to a different aspect of mental life about which we also know quite a bit. So there's a ground truth against which we can compare our data, and that's temperament, right? We know a lot about um, the early origins, the biological origins of temperamental differences between people. So we, we re-ran this experiment asking people about temperamental traits rather than knowledge. Um, we also had anchor items that had to do with physical traits or physical abilities. Uh, when did Alex uh, have blue eyes or have a good sense of smell? And about uh, a bill, and so those reasonably generated nativist responses. And then when uh, did Alex? When was Alex punctual or organized? Those generated late responses. But for the temperamental traits of like when was Alex first easygoing or fearful or anxious um, or attentive? Um, people were much showed a much um, um, bigger tendency to offer. Uh, uh, nativist responses, right? So you see much more blue over here, and 
in comparison to the graphs I showed you earlier, those circles are, sh are shifted to the left. So people are perfectly capable of offering nativist responses, and they don't think that all aspects of ourselves are due to learning. They seem to be thinking that about uh, knowledge in particular. Now, another really interesting question about the scope of this empiricist bias is whether it's the theory of, uh, it's a theory of how all minds work or it's a theory of how human minds uh, work. So like to pump your intuitions about this a little, you can think about an animal mind. Here's a spider. This spider knows how, uh, this adult spider knows how to design a complex web and how to implement building it. Do you think this spider uh, like was born knowing how to build this web or did it learn how to build this web? So that's not, a partic that's not an actual item that we tested, but along, we, we use the same intuition to guide our experiments, um, asking people about the very same perceptual and cognitive abilities, just either in human minds or in animal minds, right? Like in rats or chicks or bees. So for example, and we, we use all abilities that have been attested in the species we asked about, right? So we would ask like, how, how, where does, you know, when do human people first have approximate number knowledge and where does that come from? When do fish first have approximate number knowledge and where does that come from? And so here are, we, we did this totally between subjects, by the way. So you either asked about people or you asked about animals. And so here are the responses for people. They look hopefully quite familiar. They replicate our previous findings. People overestimate the age of onset of the core abilities and they attribute them uh, to experience and learning. What about these absolutely identical items just asked about in animal minds? All right, so we coded the people's free responses in the same way, and here are their uh, uh, explanations for animals. Right? So people were much more likely to say that uh, a fish or a rat was born with a particular ability than to say that a human child was born with that ability, and they were very m much more re ready to attribute those things to, to biology and nature um, compared to what they thought about in people. Okay, so. Uh, adults have this, seem to have this robust bias, uh, empiricism bias. Um, where does that come from? Right? Is it the result of our experience in lo having lots of formal education, or is it something that we uh, uh, pick up from the conversations we have with people? I mean, one way to ask this would be to ask whether babies are naive empiricists, and sadly for us, we haven't figured out a way to do that yet, but what Jenny uh, Wong did is the next best thing, which is that she asked verbal kids. So she asked kids um, between five and eight years old in the lab and in a science museum about the core abilities that I just talked to you about. Um, and the only difference between this experiment and what we ran with adults was that we, we gave uh, kids some prop, props to help like illustrate the bit of knowledge we were asking about. So here I'm showing you just one trial um, in which Jenny's asking this little girl about, uh, her, about moral intuitions, about um, when people have intuitions about right versus wrong. Okay, so that was a very representative trial with uh, kids. And here are the data from five to eight-year-old kids. They look just like the adult data. If anything, they look even more empiricist. And that's not because kids are incapable of attributing things to nature, right? So when we ask kids about seeing and hearing, just like adults, they can say she was just born that way. Everyone's just born with that ability, right? But for the core abilities, they almost universally said that those things had to be learned or uh, instructed. Okay, finally, for this bit of the talk, I'd like to return to the historical case uh, I started with. Remember that McCloskey, Mike McCloskey showed that um, it's not just that like contemporary lay people hold sometimes wrong beliefs about object motion, but that those wrong beliefs about object motion were also the same beliefs held by professionals, by the, the medieval scientists. Um, and so what about the case of, 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 um, of knowledge? Right? Um, is it possible that even individuals with advanced education or even individuals who are working on this problem also hold this same empiricist bias? So Jenny um, took a first step to finding out by 
surveying uh, academics at uh, uh, universities all around the United States. Um, and some of those, uh, so these are all people who were like either had a PhD or in the process of earning a PhD here in the natural sciences. So these were, uh, these were professors of biology, chemistry, physics, or in the humanities, professors of uh, religious studies or um, comparative literature. And their data look uh, pretty much just like that of uh, people on the street. Um, and so what about mind scientists? What about us? What about people who are working on questions about the origins of knowledge for uh, a living? And so Jenny queried 200 people who had PhDs in psychology, in cognitive neuroscience, in linguistics, and in philosophy. And here are their data. Right. Um, so I, I'd say the bias is attenuated a little bit. Right? Those circles are a little bit over here to that side, and there's maybe a little less orange there. But on the whole, we found that mind, mind scientists were significantly likely, just like people on the street, just like five-year-olds, to overestimate the age of onset of these core abilities, and were significantly likely, more likely than chance, to attribute them um, to learning. So you know, we psychologists also lean toward empiricist explanations. OK. So, this series of experiments comes together, I think, to suggest that adults in our culture, also adults in a, um, a very different culture that I didn't have time to tell you about today, um, that very young children and also that professionals um, all hold the intuitive belief that very basic human abilities, including core knowledge abilities, uh, arise through learning. And whether that belief is right or wrong is, of course, an empirical question. And it's a question that many of us are very actively uh, engaged in working on. But remember, the fact that we chose to focus on these, we've, we focused on these abilities for a reason, right? Because evidence suggests that, there, hint that these abilities are present really early uh, on, sometimes in the first days of life. And that suggests that people's intuitive beliefs are, um, at least in some sense, somewhat wrong. OK, so where does this bias come from? Um, that question, of course, brings to mind Lila Gleitman's wonderful old quip that empiricism is innate. Um, and indeed, like Lila was really one of the inspirations for this line of work. Um, and you know, Lila could be right. It could be that evolution has built in us uh, a bias to think about learning as the source of knowing because you know it's useful. It's useful to ensure that in information gets transmitted from person to person or passed down from generation to generation. That's possible. Um, but there's other interesting possibilities on the table, um, right? So we could gradually form an empiricist bias by maybe observing that the young of our species like, are pretty incompetent. Um, like, at least to the naked eye, babies don't seem to know very much. So that could contribute. Or maybe we, we look around us and we notice, huh, our species spends a huge amount of time and effort on pedagogy. And that could lead to the inference that without all that teaching, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know much. So these are all live options, and a lot of, of, of work remains to be done to find out where this bias really stems from. But I think all I wanted, the point I just wanted to make to you today is that this empiricist bias is present, and it's present in ways that could potentially uh, color the way we, we do work in science. OK, that said. I don't want to give, leave you with the impression um, that I'm like denigrating learning or the study of learning. Um, that's that, quite the opposite, really. I want to um, instead suggest that keeping in mind the debate between nature and nurture is going to be a really uh, useful way for us to study even learning in particular. Okay, so one way to push back against the empiricist bias that Jenny finds is to more explicitly consider the role of prior structure. Um, prior mental structure, even when we're studying learning. And so that's what I want to spend the rest of my talk on today, just by exploring one little case of how when we focus in on how learning happens, thinking about initial structure can, can, um, can be uh, enlightening. OK, so to see how considering um, an innate starting state may be useful, we can go to another classic problem in cognitive science, and that's the problem of underdeterminism in learning. Right? So look, looking around the world, it's impossible to know what we should learn about, and we can't possibly learn about any, everything. Even in a case where you have somebody, this is like a best case scenario, imagine somebody wants to tell you about the only thing in your visual field, right? They're knowledgeable and motivated to teach you, 
and you're motivated to learn, it's still impossible to know what you should be learning about. Should you be learning about like the shape of this object or some of its um, perceptual properties? Um, or like how many parts it has, how reflective it is. Should you want to learn about its spatial position relative to yourself or any number of other uh, anchors? There's, you know, the list is, is, is infinite. Um, and so the fact that learning occurs at all it seems kind of uh, mysterious uh, against this backdrop. But the fact is that the learner doesn't start from, from zero, okay? As we said, the learner starts uh, with quite a lot of knowledge already in place. Um, and these are represented by these experiments that we've already uh, talked about. And so one thing that a learner can do, rather than facing this gigantic learning space and sort of swimming around trying to not knowing what they should learn about, is to focus their learning on cases where this kind of knowledge make, um, allows them to make a prediction and that prediction was wrong. So if the learner can focus in on cases where they have the wrong mental model of the world, right, that ra radically narrows the learning space and maybe is a wedge into this, um, into this learning problem. And so that's the hypothesis that another former graduate student, Amy Stahl, set out to test. Um, she wanted to ask whether it's babies beyond just noticing violations of expectation, whether babies use these as uh, leverage points um, to, to, to learn. And so, um, to, to test this hypothesis, Amy chose uh, a, a case, uh, the case of baby's expectations about object behavior because those expectations are in place so very early in our species by about two months of age in human babies. And in other species, uh, like chicks, Giorgio Vartigara's work shows us that that knowledge is in place from the get-go, like from you know, two days uh, of chickhood. Um, so that is Amy focused on uh, a case of knowledge that we think is likely to be innate. And what she did is she showed babies a violation of physical object behavior. Here you're going to see a violation of object solidity. So an object is going to uh, appear to pass through a solid wall, violating adults' expectations. We know babies detect those kinds of weird events from two months. But what, and so you know, baby's going to see that happen. But what Amy then does is go beyond just asking whether babies notice that, but she teaches them something about the object immediately afterwards. So babies see this weird outcome, they get a little bit of time to encode it, and then she reaches in and teaches them that the object had some hidden auditory property that they couldn't have known about before. And then she's gonna measure learning. She's gonna do that in cases of violations and in almost identical cases of non-violations. The only difference in what you're seeing here is whether the object winds up here on this side of the wall or here on this side of the wall. Everything else is identical. Okay, so babies get time to encode that boring expected outcome and they get to uh, hear that the object goes squeaky squeak. And then she tests, Amy tests whether babies have learned the mapping by measuring babies' baseline preference to look at that object that they just saw either violate or accord with expectations versus a novel distractor, and then asking whether they change their looking when the sound plays. So um, she's gonna subtract babies' baseline preference to look at one object or the other. Maybe one object is just more appealing. Maybe babies just like to look at objects that violated their expectations because they're cool. She's gonna subtract that baseline preference taken during the silent period from their preference to look at one object or the other when the sound plays. And so the idea is that if babies have made the object sound mapping, if they've learned, then that preference score should be positive. They should increase their looking to the object that they just were taught about. Okay, so here are babies' uh, learning scores for the solidity violations I showed you. In the case where the ball stopped by the wall, that's the boring case, um, it was a challenging one-shot task. Babies didn't have trial after trial to learn this. They had one opportunity to learn it. We made it hard on purpose, and these 11 to 12-month-old babies failed to learn it, okay? So they did not increase their looking to the target object. But in contrast, babies who saw the identical event except the ball winds up over here, those babies robustly learned the object sound mapping. And they did that not just for that one violation of object solidity, but we saw a very similar pattern for the, for the case of a different violation, uh, object continuity. So babies um, did not learn when an object remained where it was hidden, but babies did learn where the object appeared to magically teleport to another uh, location. So babies were better at learning the information we taught them following a, a violation of expectation. Um, Amy then went on to ask what about um, infant self-guided learning. So aside from us trying to teach babies something, what do infants just to surprise, do violations of expectation change what babies themselves are, want to learn about? 
Um, and so in these experiments, she again tested 11 to 12 month olds with solidity violations or other violations. Here's another one, this is support. The object either remains fully supported or it's pushed off the edge of the cliff, but it just like hovers in midair, defying adult expectations. And then instead of teaching them something, Amy um, just gave babies the uh, object from the preceding event versus a novel object and measured like what they did with those. What, what did they want to play with? So babies own exploratory behavior. In the case where the, the ball or the car or whatever is stopped by the wall, babies ignored it subsequently and chose to play with a novel distractor. So they had a novelty preference. In cases where the object appeared to pass through the wall, uh, they ignored the distractor object and spent almost all of their time playing with the, with the object they had just seen, the perceptually boring familiar object, but the conceptually novel object. And, and we found that to be basically true for the babies who had seen the support violation as well. So violations of expectation, violations of babies' prior models of the world change what they want to then learn about. You might ask, what are babies doing during this exploratory time? And we saw variety of behaviors, but some behaviors we saw time after time. One of them was babies um, banged objects. So this baby, you'll see him like banging this, this ball against the high chair tray or banging it with his hand. Um, another behavior we often saw was dropping objects. So this baby um, spends almost all of the 30 seconds, uh, he or she is allotted, dropping the ball onto the tray or throwing the ball off the side of the tray, repeatedly forcing Amy to go retrieve it time and time again. So we saw lots of, of these kinds of behaviors. Right? But they weren't just distributed randomly. So this first baby who you saw banging the object had just seen a violation of solidity where the ball had appeared to pass through the wall. And the baby who's throwing the object over the side of the high chair tray had just seen a violation of object uh, support. So babies. These babies were tailoring their exploratory behavior to the particular violation they saw, and that was true, uh, that was true of the entire sample of babies. So here's babies who saw expected boring events that, adults, that accord with adults' predictions, and they didn't tend to do more banging or dropping. They didn't do these behaviors very often. But among the babies who saw the violation versions, their behaviors diverged, right? So babies, just like the video you saw, who saw violations of solidity tended to bang, and the other babies tended uh, to drop. Now, why are babies doing that? Right? One possibility is that why babies are exploring and why they're producing these banging and dropping behaviors is because they're looking for explanations for the violations of expectation they saw. They want to understand why they made the wrong prediction and revised their mental model. Right? Amy's data are certainly consistent with this like hypothesis testing, explanation seeking kind of interpretation. But that's a, a rich interpretation. Babies could also be banging and dropping and exploring because they just want to recreate the event they just saw. Right? It could be that uh, this lean interpretation, they're not, babies aren't seeking explanations. Maybe babies don't even know what an explanation for this event could be. They're just trying to replicate the behavior. And so my current graduate student, Jasmine Perez, sought to try and disentangle these possibilities using the logic that if babies are looking for an explanation, then if you give them one, they should stop all of that boosted exploratory behavior, right? That surprise-induced exploration should be abolished by the presence of a plausible explanation for what just happened. Um, and so Jasmine showed also like 12-month-old babies um, events, like this is a solidity violation. Look at this. Like in Amy's studies, Watch the this. object appears to pass through a wall. Look at this. And babies see that. But then some babies were given an explanation so here she rotates, oops, she rotates the wall Look at this. Um, to reveal it has a big hole in it. So that's a plausible explanation for how the thing, car wound up on the other side of the wall, right? For half the babies in the study, the wall's rotated and there's no explanation, it's just revealed to be wholly solid. So the surprise is expected to continue, okay? So she, Jasmine compares babies' exploration uh, activities in these two cases. Here's Amy's old data showing that when the ball or a car or whatever passes through the wall, they prefer to explore that familiar target object that just behaved weirdly. And here's Jasmine's data that show that just rotating the wall and showing that it has a hole in it makes that entirely go away. And now babies don't show that exploratory preference uh, anymore. And so what this suggests to us is that in addition to being able to recognize violations of expectation and notice when one's predictions don't conform to new evidence, so babies can do that, but they can also recognize reasons why that might have happened, okay? 
Um, and so these findings maybe start to paint a picture whereby we can think about responses to surprising events in babies, not as some monolithic construct, like they're just surprised or they're not, there's a violation of expectation or not, but maybe um, you can unpack this into mul multiple, perhaps separate, stages of processing. So right, babies could see the violation, notice the violation at all. They could recognize an explanation if there's one available for that violation. They could show enhanced learning. That's the surprise-induced learning I showed you several slides back. They could show surprise-induced exploration, targeting what they choose to search about uh, to objects that behave surprisingly. And there's an interesting possibility that these are all uh, sort of, you know, separate, separate consequences of detecting violations. Okay, so we tested all of these at 12 months in, in work that Jasmine has been doing. But if these are all separate, separable components, that makes kind of an interesting prediction, which is that there should be patterns of correlation, patterns of concordance, if you bring these kids back and test them longitudinally. So, Taya mentioned that Gergo's not interested in individual differences. I'm not particularly interested in individual differences either, except in the sense that they can provide us a way to carve apart different processes that might be interestingly distinct. So Jasmine looked for individual differences in these kids who she tested at 12 months in a solidity violation, ball goes through wall, and she brought them back six months later, 18 months, and showed them a different violation, a violation of expectations of support. So here she tested, do they notice the violation when a thing hovers in midair? Do they detect when there's a plausible explanation for that happening? Like, we show them that actually there was a supporting box under there that you didn't, you didn't know about. Do they show interest in that explanation? Um, do they show surprise-induced learning? Do they show surprise-induced exploration? So she measures these all again in these infants. And today I'm just going to focus on the first two components, on noticing a violation and detecting an explanation for it. So what we found is that, strikingly, individual differences at 12 months predicted individual differences at 18 months. So the, the babies who were most interested in the ball passing through the wall when they were 12 months were the babies who were most interested in a hovering object at 18 months. And that's not because some babies are just long lookers, right? So here's the data from another group of babies who at 12 and 18 months saw totally boring expected versions of those events. They saw a ball stopped by a wall and they saw an object fully supported. And babies looking times at 12 months in those expected conditions did not predict at all they're, they're, they're looking at 18 months, okay? <laughs> Suggesting that there really is something to the individual differences we observed to the violation conditions up there. Um, and similarly, we saw consistent in individual differences in babies' interest in explanations for violations. So the more interested babies were at 12 months in the explanation for the solidity event, here's a wall, it has a big hole in it, the more interested they were in an explanation for a violation of a support event at uh, 18 months. And in contrast, if you look at babies' behavior cross-sectionally, so within a particular time slice, those two abilities were not related. So how long you look at a violation of expectation didn't actually predict how long you're interested in an explanation, okay? So just because you were really interested in a solidity violation doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be very good at noticing an explanation for that. Further suggesting to us that these may be separable cognitive processes. And finally, just like sort of a teaser, in ongoing work, Jasmine's been looking at these individual differences further out in developmental time. So she's brought these kids back at age two and a half years old and tested them on a battery of different cognitive tasks, some of which we predicted to be related to these surprise processes that we measured starting at 12 months, and others of which we predicted would not be related. And I'll just show you a little dose of data. <laughs> um, so here's baby, here, no, these, are, these are toddlers' curiosity scores in a task where we measured their curiosity by giving them a box that had all these hidden features and asking how many of those hidden features did they find in a constrained amount of time. Their curiosity scores at two and a half years were predicted by their interest in an explanation for an impossible event at age 12 months. And that's not due to like, you know, general cognitive differences because we found no prediction um, um, in other kinds of two-year-old abilities. So how interested you were in an explanation when, back when you were a baby did not predict your inhibitory control in a task where you had to uh, overwrite a learned sorting rule and learn a new sorting rule for putting blocks in buckets. So totally not predicted. Similarly, uh, your, your response to surprising events at 12 months did not predict your working memory at age uh, two. 
Okay, so summing up from the second half of my talk, um, findings like these that I've shown you coming from Amy Stahl and, and, and Jasmine Perez um, suggest to us that beyond just noticing violations of expectation in the world, babies use these violations to their advantage. They use these violations um, to help solve a learning problem. Okay, so, you know, it was convenient for us that babies, for us as a field, that babies look longer at surprising events because that allowed us to characterize what expectations they came to the lab uh, with. But it's not just that babies look longer because they're noticing the events. Our data suggests that they may look longer because they're trying to revise their mental model of the world. And if you combine that with the notion that the expectations that babies are coming to the lab with are there from the get-go, you know, are there from two months in, babe, in humans, are there from two days in chicks, um, that those, those expectations are innate, then you come to the conclusion that babies are using innate core knowledge uh, to help solve the learning problem. And then, you know, our, our newer data suggests that babies' ability to do this varies from learner to learner. Um, we see stable individual differences in babies' uh, responses to surprising events. And these individual differences may persist at least early in life um, and give rise to different learning outcomes in childhood, right? So it's not just that babies have intuitive theories. They use these in interesting ways to learn, and their ability to do so may contribute meaningful variants to later outcomes. So why does that matter? And how does it relate to like the first half of my talk? Um, so aside from telling us something interesting about learning, I think that these findings may be an illustration of how really considering the debate between and the contributions of nature and nurture um, can be informative for understanding cognition and for understanding uh, developmental uh, change. So you know, a large part of our field is the study of learning, of, is the study of understanding uh, experience-driven um, change, and I think that's a really important part of our field. And what I mean to suggest is that by studying learning, explicitly considering the contributions of, of nature, that may lead us um, to some fruitful discoveries. And then last, kind of a related point, which is that uh, the human mind is a, is a peculiar organ, which is capable of, of amazing feats, but also sometimes gets things quite systematically uh, wrong. And because we use this organ to do our science, I think it really behooves us to understand how the ways in which we might get things systematically wrong, the ways in which we have biases, um, may shape how we do our work. And that's true for scientists of all stripes. So whether you're uh, a biologist, a chemist, a physicist, or yes, a psychologist, we really ought to know what kinds of intuitive theories we may have, we may have had all throughout our lifespan that may uh, shape how we do our work, that may color the kinds of hypotheses we come up with in doing our science, that may color the kinds of experiments we choose to do, the way we interpret our data. Um, and I think that highlights a role for our field throughout sciences in characterizing these biases and helping us figure out you know, how to measure them um, and how to correct for them. And that by doing that, uh, we may all be able to work toward a more accurate uh, understanding of the world. Okay, and with that, I'll end, so thank you. Hi, Lisa. Um, here. Hi, <laughs> Gail. Thank you very much. Um, question about your second part of the talk, and I think, I th I think there, there is probably some evidence on that, but I wonder if you have uh, new evidence on that. And going back to your sort of conceptual change uh, reference, uh, Susan, um, it seems like your paradigm can be really useful to understanding whether infants have really a coherent theory about objects, for instance. So is it the case that an infant that has seen a violation of solidity then has an expectation that support may also be violated. Uh, so if I remember correct, I think Karen Wynn had some data on that, right, of solidity violation and then the yeah. possibility of objects being absent or disappearing. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a really interesting question and I don't have data on it. But there are data from other studies that suggest that, it's, that maybe, right, when a baby sees a violation of expectation, then all bets are off and they don't know how that object is going to behave with respect to other principles. In fact, that's both very interesting but also an impediment for, uh, for, for us methodologically because um, 
this, this series of studies that I was able to tell you about in just a few minutes took so many years to complete because we had to do it entirely between subjects. Because it just doesn't work to show a baby a violation and then an expect expected event because seeing a ball pass through a wall, right, we've, what we found is that babies no, you know, it, it, babies now, it's unclear whether they should expect the next ball, even a different ball, to pass through the wall or to be stopped by the wall, right? So, I mean, that's both, you know, makes it slower to do our work but is potentially uh, quite interesting. I think it's open, right, whether, that, and that's within a particular violation. So whether babies now also just sort of give up and say, I don't know whether this, this object is gonna hover or remain supported, um, you know, we don't know. I think it'd be really interesting to test. John? Hi, uh, so thank you very much. Very interesting talk. I have one super short question and one slightly longer question. Where are you? Uh, I'm right at the very oh, yeah. back. Hi. I'm here, yeah. So uh, the super short question, uh, the open mind study is very interesting and have you done it cross-culturally at all? So beyond uh, your lab. Uh, the second question, so there's, a, there's kind of a subversive subtext that it seemed to me running through the whole talk which you chose not to completely spell out. So are our own theories in cognitive psychology and more specifically cognitive development biased? Uh, should our bias, sh should we be correcting for those biases? Have we corrected for those biases in the way we theorize about, you know, the development of cognition? <laughs> yeah. So the the easy question um, is, we've done a little bit of cross cultural uh, work. So one thing Jenny did is she thought, well, all of the adults she tested were like, you know, uh, Western. Uh, you know, adults who'd been exposed to lots of technology and lots of formal education. There's lots of uh, cultures that you might want to test. What, what we did is just one. So she, she tried to test Indian adults because the idea that um, she, she restricted her participant pool um, to Hindu adults, thinking that if people have a belief in reincarnation, maybe they'd be more likely to think that some aspects of the mind would like be inherited and be innate. But actually she saw just as strong or even stronger a bi uh, an empiricist bias in that adult sample. So you know that's a, a very modest uh, uh, foray into the direction you uh, suggested, but our data are consistent with that, the notion that the empiricist bias is, is universal in our sample so far. Um, with a harder question, you're right, I didn't, so I, I intentionally sort of like sprinkled out those seeds, but I have no experiments yet. I mean, there's lots of experiments that our data sort of su su suggest, right? And both those experiments could be done both um, for, for among lay people and among scientists. For example, is it harder, like, do people have, so here's, here's a, a kind of a dumb one, but you could imagine, is it harder to get experiments published when they lead to conclusions that fight against these biases than that accord with these biases? You might expect either way, right? You might expect that people would be more um, likely to believe experiments that show you know, powerful learning mechanisms, or you might be, suggest that people would be more likely to publish surprising experiments or the surprising experiments that fight against this bias and show us that actually these abilities are there from in neonates um, would generate a lot of attention because they defy our predictions. Right? So that's one kind of thi way, way you, th thing you could look at. But I think, I mean, what I do mean to say that I think it's very important that we do exactly what you said and look at how these biases might actually affect our practice. I, as I said at the end, I don't think that's only true for psychology. I, myself, I think it's kind of surprising that there's not also a study in every domain of science of like, what are the intuitive beliefs that uh, you know, that, that people have in chemistry and all these other disciplines. It seems like that would be an important starting state uh, to know to be able to take a step back and, and evaluate the progress we make in our field. We haven't done that hard work yet, um, but I hope, I hope people will, will do it. Thank you very much. Um, let me just briefly express a, a, an internal state first. I, my admiration for the Budapest group is uh, almost infinite, and it matched by the Susan Carey uh, uh, and students group, and this talk was one of the reasons for my admiration. So uh, I, I would like to follow up on the question on cross-cultural uh, uh, issues, and I want to motivate it. And I, I, would like, I, would ask you, I would like to ask you if you thought or if, if you would consider it to be useful to explore the constellation of ideas that turn around this issue about uh, the empiricist origin of knowledge. So for example, Descartes had this idea that every living being is essentially an automaton, except for us, right? 
and uh, because we have the soul, and so on and so on. So the idea of uh, um, um, knowledge not being innate is very much connected, could be very much connected with this idea that we have free will, that we have the soul, and so on and so on. And I was wondering if you consider to just extend this kind of work to figure out what's the model, as it were, not of knowledge per se, but of the, as it were, the agent of knowledge. Yeah. And in this case, I think the cross-cultural uh, question becomes very important because it becomes very important to figure out whether this is just dependent of our Western culture or not. I wonder. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Um, we, I agree that would be really interesting and important to do. We haven't done it. We, Jenny took like a, a first stab maybe in the direction that you suggest um, in data that I didn't show you, which is that she also polled her adult subjects on some of their beliefs that could, we thought maybe, this was a course step, maybe could be relevant to predicting the kinds of explanations they gave to the origins of knowledge. So we asked them like, their religiosity on a scale of one to 10. We asked them about their beliefs in free will. Um, but again, this is a very limited sample. Among the, in the data that we had, um, we didn't see any systematic uh, uh, patterns, right? Um, we also asked about things like whether uh, participants themselves had young children. Um, because we reasoned that right, you might, it might, you might be uh, less likely, you may be more likely to believe in, in, in nature after you try to parent and all of your efforts come to naught, right? Um, um, but we didn't see anything systematic there, but I think, that, like I said, I think that was a very coarse first step and that, um, yeah, I think those are really interesting ideas to explore, we gotta do it. Okay, Hayo. Uh, hi, Lisa, thanks for the wonderful talk. And uh, my question is about the object, map, object sound mapping study in your science paper you, uh, with Aimi. I've seen you talk about these studies and Aimi and uh, Jasmine too a few times, and I think I'm just having a new appreciation of what that study is showing. And I'm just trying to think about why is learning enhanced? Like, what does that mean? And what, what is, this, is there something interesting about this person who is showing something that is very unlikely to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, is it just about attention grabbing? It's very surprising and therefore they're just attending to everything that comes after and that's why they're showing this object uh, sound mapping. Mm -hmm. And because this study is actually a little bit different from what the rest of the studies are showing, the exploration and the violation of um, the hypothesis testing part. So yeah. is there something interesting about this person who is showing the baby yeah. that there is something super interesting and therefore I'm trying to show you that these objects that violating this property has this really interesting latent property too and that's why they're mapping the sound to the object as opposed to here's an object that just rolls down the ramp yeah. and therefore there's no reason for you to constrain the mapping of the sound to just this particular class of objects. I'm just wondering about can we pit yeah. two people who's showing different events and see whether they prefer to learn from that person or something like that. I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah, so there's so many interesting things in, in what you just said. Um, one thing, we, so we, I, don't, I don't know to the extent to which this um, enhancement depends on having a social context. This is sort of a minimally social context. There's no faces or anything, but clearly they're like, there's a hand and there's a voice. And even when the things are mapping, there's a hand. And so if that were all entirely removed, would you still find this effect? Um, I, I don't know, I think it's wide open. Like, I, I think it's, it's pl totally plausible that you would. Um, in fact, like right if, on these, if, if what you're trying to do is learn about cases where you got things wrong, that happens all the time in non-social contexts as well, but I think it's an open question. I mean, another thing that's raised by your question is why do they learn this object sound mapping like at all? Um, and, in, in, and, and so why is there surprise induced learning? Right. And so combined with the exploratory uh, evidence I showed you earlier, I would say that this also is probably reflects the attempt to search for some kind of explanation. But you might say like, well, whether the, the thing squeaks or rattles doesn't provide much of an explanation, right? So why would you wanna learn that? And uh, I think that's, that's sort of true, although the kind of properties that an object has, including its insides or what sounds it's make, are plausibly related to what it's going to do in the future. To really find out, you're gonna to wanna to know, is there a scope of things that, do, that, that babies can get enhancement and learning about, and a scope of things that are just like irrelevant, right? Like some fact about uh, that this object came from, was given to me by this person or that person isn't going to explain whether it goes through walls or not. Um, and so looking at the scope of that learning enhancement um, you know, is work yet to be done, yeah. Thank you, we have to finish here. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.